please welcome Kathleen Taylor. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here and to be honest um, with you. I feel some responsibility about doing right by this topic today because I think honesty is an enormous concept to try and unpack. So I'm not going to try to unpack it. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to tell you a little bit about who I am and where I've been and some experiences I've had that have given me kind of one view of what lived honesty can look like. And I want to tell you why I think it's important, because that is, is as honest as I can be with you this morning. So Tara just uh, told you, basically my entire career, um, really half of my life, literally, has been in and around death and dying and end of life care, which is a real conversation stopper. Um, <laughs> Uh, so how this happened was um, shortly after I finished graduate school, I interviewed for a job with hospice. And at the time, I didn't really know much about what that was. And the job was to be the counselor who goes into dying people's homes and helps them and their family kind of deal with um, the fact that their lives are ending. So this sounded like an impossible, ridiculous job, and I could not imagine myself doing it, so of course I said yes. And I did that job for a little over seven years. And what I can tell you is that those experiences with people at the end of their lives became the foundation for everything that I do, everything I've ever done in, in really a, a whole professional career. And it changed the way that I see honesty, and, and those things are kind of all related. So when I just said, you thought it was a joke when I said it's a conversation stopper, what I do, it's not, um, not a joke. The usual response that I get when people are talking and networking and say, oh, what do you do? And then I tell them a little bit about what I do. What usually happens is people say, oh, that sounds, <coughs> depressing it sounds that sounds hard and what I want to tell you is that it's it's quite the contrary I, I love being around people who are at the end of their lives because they're the most honest people you're gonna meet people are sometimes at their most authentic when they're looking at the end of their life and I, I think that's because when when that stuff is real, people don't have a lot of time or energy. Well, they don't. They don't have time, and they don't have energy for anything less than that. When I was in, uh, in the field watching people die, I would see what looked to me like little miracles pretty much every day. People would manage to bridge the distance between them and people that they loved if there was any distance. And they would do that through what seemed to me incredible acts of, of bravery, like, like forgiveness, um, letting go of things that they had a stance on. And estranged families, I don't know how this happened, sometimes they would just, whatever the, the thing was, they'd manage to let go of the thing that was keeping them estranged. And sometimes, People would do things like make declarations about who they really are and what really matters to them. And I think it's because people want to be known for who they truly are. And when it's the last days, sometimes this was the very last opportunity for people to say, this is who I really am. So sometimes the miracles look like that. Now, I, I, I always have to, I have to say, that didn't always happen. I, every time I talk about this, invariably, somebody will come up to me afterwards and tell me a story, you know who you're going to be, about a person that they knew who remained a complete asshole um, all the way until the moment of their death, or who became an asshole as they were dying. So I will say, that happens too. Um, and, and may sometimes actually be a reflection of who that person's you know, an aspect of their true nature, and sometimes it's something like delirium or dementia that, that has people just acting in a way that's not really them. So, yeah, it doesn't always happen, but, but the hopeful news is that 
those little miracles were much more the, the rule than, than the exception. So for me, this work has never been depressing. Um, and having been a witness to this kind of honesty and authenticity that I've seen, I find that I have a, you know, good, bad, or indifferent. I have a really low tolerance for, for much less than that um, now. And I'm sharing these secrets with you, so my hope is that you'll, you'll develop a low tolerance for, for less than honest and authentic um, as you leave here. So I'm not telling you anything that's a, a big revelation or surprise to you. I mean, you, you've all bought the book and, and seen the meme or, or whatever that we can learn from people who are dying. So this, this isn't a surprise. Um, with that in mind, whoop. Have you heard of the Before I Die project? Yes. Yeah? Okay, good. Um, the Before I Die project was started by Candy Chang, the first wall she created in New Orleans. She had gone through an experience, um, someone she cared about very much died and she went through an experience with grief that showed her, as, as most grieving people see, how much as a society we avoid talking about and, and facing conversations about dying. So she decided to paint an abandoned house in her neighborhood with chalkboard paint and stencil these words, before I die, I want to, on the wall. And the next day, the whole thing was filled up and bubbling beyond the margins. So people somehow wanted to talk about this. Um, this is a, a photo, am I standing in your way? This is a photo of the St. Pete Before I Die wall. Did anybody see this? Which Ren tells me was on the side of the Independent. I wrote on it. Did you write on it? I'm not telling you what I wrote, but I, one, of those, one of those is mine. So I don't know if you can see what's up here, but it really, it, it truly runs the gamut. I mean, it's just a hot mess of the longing and gratitude and desire and pain and all this, this stuff that we creatively find in ourselves when you even just think about the prospect of dying. And there's everything from, I want to go to a Nickelback concert to uh, <laughs> I want to fall in love. So it does, it does run the gamut. I love this project because it's provocative and it gets people thinking about what they, what they really want. And I'll tell you what I would love to see, is if next to this wall, there was another wall that said, what I have done today is blank. And then what I wonder is, would these walls have anything to do with each other? And would your what I've done today wall lead to your before I die I want to wall? Because, you know, if you want to go to a Nickelback concert, at some point you got to buy a ticket. Um, <laughs> and, and, and what I think is that the walls probably wouldn't match up very well. They really probably wouldn't. I think sometimes our hopes and dreams and our daily lives don't often look that much alike. And I think why is because when we think about dying, it's hypothetical to us, except, you guys, it's not hypothetical. I have terrible, wonderful news for you. <laughs> We're all going to die. You're all going to die. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's a lovely thing to be aware of. I'll, I'll, a funny story, I was um, having lunch with a, one of my dearest old friends last week who also happens to be my ex-husband. And, um, <laughs> true. And I was musing about this talk. He's saying, what are you doing? I'm telling him I'm doing this talk. And I was telling him that I was going to talk about lessons that I learned from people when I was watching people die all day long. And he looks at me and says, yeah, I remember you walking around the house muttering, we're all gonna die. <laughs> so, so I apologized. Um, I may have gone through a dark time there. Uh, but then we had a nice conversation about 
about what I really meant. And, and what I really meant was we're all going to die and we're alive right now. That's, that's the flip side of memento mori is, yeah, you're, you're going to die and you're alive right now. You're alive today. And the fact that you're not promised a tomorrow isn't awful. It, it makes today precious. It makes, it makes today the day that's full of all the possibility. It makes today, today the day you can get to whatever that really is. So you've all brushed up against this awareness before. We, we all do. That's why there's self-help books that, and, and memes that talk about this kind of stuff. So it's, it's not a new idea. Um, we have little micro experiences with death and dying and with being aware of our own mortality on a fairly regular basis. And sometimes that's, uh, you know, someone that you know dies or a celebrity dies. Um, for me, it happens if I'm driving down the highway and I see a terrible accident and, I, and it's one of those that you just know somebody didn't walk away from that. So we have these little brushes where, and we even give them names like it's a wake up call, it's sobering, because they snap us out of our slumber. And for a little while, for a minute, shit gets real. And, and, and then we get real. And then we kind of forget about it until we brush up against the next experience that reminds us of that. And, uh, what we do in those moments is usually we get grateful. Uh, usually I think when we really kind of remember that this is temporary, we end up calling somebody that we care about and, and talking about how lucky we are. We do that kind of gratitude stuff. And then, you know, we fall back asleep. And I don't know why we do that. I don't know why we fall back asleep after we've awakened to our mortality. Maybe we can't hang out there all the time because we need to go to work and run errands and you know pick up the dog poop um, and get on with our lives. And maybe it's too hard to remember that all the time. But I think the reason that we don't walk around with this as part of our daily consciousness is because we let it scare us instead of letting it inspire us. So this awareness doesn't have to be terrifying. It actually can be clarifying. And that's what I hope you can think about. And the clarity that we get in these moments helps us better understand the gap between what we really want, the before I die wall, and the what am I doing today wall. Why is there that distance? So when we're awake, sometimes we can see that that distance, maybe in, in personal relationships, it's made up of things like attachment to being right, which probably this day, these days it's about politics, um, a, a, a precious grudge that we're holding. Um, usually the distance in personal relationships is about things that are unspoken or unforgiven. And sometimes the distance is, is practical stuff that we put between our day right now and a dream that we have. So we will talk about reasons we're not doing a thing we really want to do, but those reasons are not in the form of a plan. They're, they're more like when I have enough money or when I get promoted or when this is certain or this is stable. So we put stuff off with these practical reasons that just become miles. And sometimes the distance is between us and, and us, <laughs> um, between us being honest with ourselves about who we really are and what our life looks like and if those things are matching up. So when it's not hypothetical and when people are actually dying, everything kind of shrinks down to what they can do today because that's all they have. And, and the little secret I'm trying to tell you guys today is that's all any of us have, actually, because you don't get to know. <laughs> um, you don't get to know when. Some people have an idea, but you don't get to know when. 
There's a doctor named Ira Bayak who's, who's worked in death and dying for decades, and he wrote a book called The Four Things That Matter Most. And he has these four things that he's pulled out of watching people die well as kind of the, the tasks um, at the end of life. And they're, please forgive me, I forgive you, thank you, and I love you. So, so when it's real, it tends to be about gratitude and, and forgiveness and expressions of love. And what I want to suggest to you guys is that these things that people actually do in their last days, you can do today. That's not that hard. Well, sometimes it's hard. But it can be done. If you can do it on the last day, you can do it today. I mean, get ahead of it. So here's a, another thing I'll tell you that's true. Um, a few years ago, I did a TEDx talk about, uh, kind of about a similar thing, about lessons that people at the end of life teach us. And then a weird thing happened. Um, people responded. And people started emailing me and calling me and telling me stories about how they were looking at their lives because of the lessons in the talk. And honestly, it freaked me out. And um, it caused me to look really hard at my own life. And at, the, at, at that time, I'd, I'd been promoted a few times at, at hospice. I was in a, a leadership position. And even though I loved the, the mission, the truth was that I really only loved a, you know, a sliver of what I was doing every day for work. Um, I, I, you know, in a leadership role, I, I have no stomach for organizational politics. None of that stuff works for me. I would do it, but I didn't love it. And there was just that little slice that I loved, and that slice was about teaching people how to cultivate empathy and compassion and talk to people who are sick. That was the part I loved. So. So I did a crazy thing and I quit a job that I'd been at this place for 20 years. And I did it with not really having a plan and I did it against the advice of most of the people who cared about me, um, who were saying, no, you can't do that. Um, and I did it anyway. And I started a, uh, my own consulting practice with the promise to myself that I wasn't gonna do anything that I don't love. And it's, the story ends well. Um, <laughs> because the truth is that now I'd only do, I only do things I love, which is amazing. You, you can, and I'm telling you this story because this was a form of honesty, of, of looking at my life choices and who I really was and seeing if those lined up and, and really finding some places where I was there out of, out of comfort and nostalgia more than I was out of this really being what I wanted to do, and it was a hard realization. But you can line your life choices up with your truth, I promise you, um, you can, or you can find your truth in the life choices that you've made. And, and it's a great way to stop doing shit you hate. So when you align your life with some authenticity, unexpected and wonderful opportunities can show up because now they, they have room to. And in my case, they did. Um, so I had, when I worked at hospice, I was used to bumping into, um, seriously, like 1,500 people on a regular basis. There's people around all the time. And it only took me about three weeks of working in my home office before I realized, oh my God, I've got to figure out a way to be around some people. And I'd always wanted to try to do something kind of in, in the arts. And at the same time, I had read a couple of articles that talked about improv as a form of communication skill. And that was interesting to me because it had to do with the, the business that I had just started. And then I went to a, a random party. Like, I almost didn't go, is how random it was. And I saw an old acquaintance who asked me what I was doing now. And when I told him, he just blurted out, 
you should take an improv class. <laughs> so, so since there are, are no coincidences, I, I think, um, I, the next day I signed up for an improv class in American Stage. And I could not possibly have known, I'm going to cry talking about this, I could not have known the amount of bliss that I would find in that. And I think what happened was I got honest with myself and I cleared a path for that to come to me. And now, um, as you heard, I, I moonlight, that was a great word. Um, <laughs> I, I actually teach a, a class in the improv program. I'm on, I've been on a couple of house teams. I'm on a couple of, I'll improv with anybody who wants to do it, a couple of independent teams. And I have made friends who are part of my soul family. I know I'm gonna know these people for the rest of my life. And it happened because I cleared a path for this to occur. And here's a funny coincidence. Improv actually happens to be a great way to practice honesty because it doesn't work without it. Um, if you're just up there telling jokes, that's stand-up, which is also great, but, but not how improv works. So, oh, thank you for switching that. Yeah, that's my last year team. I'm making an attractive face in that. <laughs> um, so here's the thing about living more honestly. It's contagious. I think all of us know somebody who is like this, someone who's just sort of fearlessly honest with themselves um, and with what they do, and, and it's, it's nice to be around. And I, when I'm around people like that, I want to be more like that. So honesty is a thing that kind of pays itself forward. And I think when we live that way, it, it makes a ripple. It makes a ripple. Uh, <laughs> there is, there's a ripple effect in, in our relationship with ourselves when we're honest, in our relationships with others when we're, we're practicing that and living that way, and in our ability to be creative and find things that where we're, we're practicing our truth, it makes a dent in the world. So I think honesty is, is a form of um, being the change we want to see in the world. So they, they feel like little choices, but they ripple out. So my question for you then today is, what can you do today to live more honestly? Because I know there's something. And I thank you for listening. And I thank you for being who you are. You. So mine is kind of like a personal story and then also a question at the end of it. So I also quit my job um, without a backup plan. So everyone told me that my job was good, it was fine, like even though I wasn't super happy in it, like just keep it because it's a stable thing. And I couldn't wake up any day and go there anymore. Yeah. Like it was soul sucking and just horrible. And it came to the point where I had to decide, do I give myself another month here or do I quit? And I quit. So it was terrifying and really um, empowering at the same time. And what I found was, <laughs> I'm getting like emotional thinking yeah. about it, <laughs> um, that people were shocked that I did that. They were like, yeah. how could you do something like that? Like that was so, authentic and genuine and just like honest with yourself and I couldn't go on living like it sounds so cheesy to say but I just couldn't go on doing the job that I hated because everyone told me that I should be doing it mm -hmm. so sorry <laughs> it's like I still get excited thinking about that I did that like it was just a moment that I was honest with myself and made that decision a hundred percent like fuck what everyone else thinks <laughs> like I just want to do something that makes me happy <laughs> And luckily the universe answered and like I found a job and like everything's fine now, but it was just that moment that people were so shocked that I did something that was so like authentic and genuine that um, I was wondering, this leads into my question, it's kind of like a two part, but did you, how do you, how do I word this? Um, do you find people are shocked when you're that kind of authentic person? Cause that's what I strive to be is like honest with myself and not really faking it to be somebody's image of what I should be. And also, um, there's also, 
I think authenticity is a little bit overrated in a sense that people try to be genuine and authentic at every single stage of their life, but there are moments like there's a quote, something that you can't live in a constant state of authenticity because, okay, it's going to get kind of weird, so just bear with me. <laughs> it's like this philosophy professor, I saw a quote on Tumblr and it was like, you can't live in a constant state of authenticity because it's like living with a constant orgasm. Like there are moments that you have these authentic things and it's like, oh my God, that felt hmm. so good, but you can't always exist in that. I know, sorry y'all, that was like a really weird question, but... Um, <laughs> Yeah, I just have a lot of rambling thoughts, so I guess address that <laughs> however you want. <laughs> it was just, yeah, exactly. But it, I feel really inspired by your talk. Like, this was oh, just something you. that made me really think about everything that I've done. So I'm done talking now, so now you can talk. <laughs> Sorry, y'all. I had a lot of coffee this morning. <laughs> Shout out me, <Mae> coffee. <laughs> I think I got some of what was the, the, the question. At the very least, I, I love the idea of a constant orgasm, so I'm, I'm down with that. Um, I don't know. That's a curious idea to me that we can't be authentic all the time. I mean, I, I think there's, um, you know, we all have different aspects of ourselves that we leverage depending on what the situation is. The, the, the person you are at the bar is a little bit different than the person you are in the boardroom because those are different settings. But it doesn't mean that, that's, that each of those aspects and facets is not truly you because all, they, they all come together and that's who you are. So I, I don't know, that's a curious thought. I'll have to think more about that and, and more about the constant orgasm thing too. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I believe you saved it. <laughs> Okay, yes. maybe I can get at her question a different way. <laughs> um, so you're having a conversation with a friend and she wants your support and you know that and you're listening and what she's saying you totally, completely disagree with and think is bad for her. So I'm trying to get a relationship between the honesty and authenticity you advocate yeah. and your friendship for this woman. That's, I'm so glad you asked that. Um, actually, Tara and I had a conversation. I was hoping someone would ask something like that today. Um, with honesty also comes a, a little responsibility in how you're honest. And I think we, you know, what we don't want to do is, is, is do our honesty on someone because that's how I'm living my life is I'm just being honest and <laughs> telling everybody what I think. So that's, that's not what, what this means. I, I think, is particularly in relationships, there's a form of honesty that comes with valuing the relationship more than you value being right. And, and, and that, it's, that's, it's honest to value a relationship more than you value being right. And then to look at ourselves about why we're so attached to what I think is good or bad for another person. So I'm, I'm kind of talking around what you're asking and trying to answer it. One of the things that I do is I work with uh, doctors and nurses and clinicians who are talking to people that are very sick. And one of the things they often have to do is tell that person they don't have a lot of time left. And that's really hard for clinicians to do, and it's a form of honesty. But one of the things that's super important in doing that is you don't just say, bam, you got two months, see you later. It's important to check in with the people that you're being honest with about how and if they want to receive what it is you're trying to offer. It doesn't make you less honest to hold on to something because to put it on somebody would be a burden to them. So I think we don't want to mistake um, radical honesty for, again, just kind of shooting off at the hip and not paying attention to the way you're affecting other people. We want to pay attention to being truly honest and also being respectful and being thoughtful and being kind and making sure that whatever you offer to someone else is true, kind, necessary, and improves the silence. 
Does that make sense? Where to go? So, as you mentioned, nothing is. Ooh, where are you? Right here. Oh, okay. <laughs> as you mentioned, you said nothing is by coincidence, and my heart has been beating your entire time talking <laughs> because I have to share this with you. So, my grandmother, she had 19 kids, and literally for the last eight years, they've been saying she doesn't have time, she doesn't have time. She just went into hospice this year, and um, she's basically seen all of her children and most of her grandchildren, but I have yet to see her. Mm -hmm. And I, I, to be honest with you, I feel like I'm Miguel from Coco that needs to go into the underworld to go like get her father and then like maybe she will go. <laughs> um, and and um, I don't want this to sound bad, but I'm just waiting for her to not die, but like to go because we keep hearing that people keep saying oh she doesn't she doesn't have time she doesn't have time but it's like she's holding on to something and so your experience with dealing with patients in hospice you know what I mean do you have any ideas like what she could be holding on to or maybe you know the it hasn't kicked in or am I Miguel like should I go to the underworld like should I go get, should I go get her father <laughs> wow um. <laughs> No, it's, it's, uh, thank you for sharing that. That's a, I, I love hearing about her and I'm trying, kind of imagining what she's like. I don't know her, so I have no um, way of offering to you any kind of uh, opinion about what she might be hanging on to, if anything. I think that's um, sometimes something that those of us who are, because it's all of us, it's not those of us, it's all of us, are kind of, you know, we get a little hinked up by the idea of death, and when someone's dying, it's, it's weird. Um, people don't know what to do. And sometimes that thing about why haven't they gone yet, they're waiting for something, it, that's what we're doing. She's not gone because she's not gone, because she's here today. Yeah. So she's doing something today while she's here. And I don't know what you need to do. I think you probably know that. But one of the things I've seen that I wish I'd see less of is people avoiding folks who are dying because they don't look like they used to or it's hard for, it's hard for me to see her this way. Well, it's probably hard for her to be that way. And I think one of the, the lovely things we can do is just show up. And you don't have to know what to say. And you don't have to do anything. You literally don't have to know anything. You can just be there. There's such a, a, a powerful thing about just being present and being a witness as somebody's doing whatever it is that they're doing. And, and I don't know if she can still talk, but one of the things you might do is ask her. If she seems like she's hanging on, ask her why. And thank you for that story again. Hi. Um, I know you worked with the patients a lot, but I guess this is kind of a question for like family members who have to deal with grief. Um, I feel like denial is a pretty common coping mechanism for dealing with the loss of somebody. So I'm wondering if you can like explain how to, I guess, be honest with your grief and if you have any advice on how to deal with things like that. Well, again, these are just such huge questions. Um, <laughs> Denial is a common thing. Um, denial also exists for a reason because it's a thing we can do when we can't do the thing we can't do yet. So it gets kind of a bad rap sometimes, denial, when, when sometimes there's a, a purpose to that. So sometimes people can't feel all the feelings because their aperture can't blow wide open yet and they can just sort of, you know, they're, they're trying to get through the day and feel all that they can feel. So I, I wouldn't worry way too much about kind of a functional level of denial. If it's something that you or whoever you're thinking of feels is not a functional level, um, I think get some help. I mean, these, these are big feelings. And like I said about Candy Chang, when she went through grief, Part of what she, I mean, she felt like an alien walking through the world just thinking, I'm having all of these feelings and nobody talks about this stuff. Nobody, there's a tiny, it's all, have you, you're, I love bookstores, but do you ever look for the grief section in a bookstore or a library if they even have one? It's embedded in the self-help section. Um, it's awful. <laughs> there, it's, it's, it's amazing how we won't, um, we just won't, talk about this stuff in an open way. 
if it's a friend you're thinking of, or if it's you you're thinking of, I think just talk about as much as you can talk about. And, and you know, you don't, people don't have to, there's no getting over grief. I think that's a big myth. You don't actually get over it. You learn to accommodate it and you're, it, it absorbs into your life. It's not a thing you forget. I don't know if, it, it, probably everybody's had somebody they love die. Um, I, I know that's true. And you don't, we're not supposed to get over it. We're supposed to learn to live with it. So I don't know if that helped at all, did it? Okay. <laughs> So this is another balance question. How do you balance being honest to yourself and your dreams and living your authentic life with also reality? Because yes, we could die today or tomorrow, but most of us also have to realistically plan for the days after that, um, especially if you have a family and right. if you have you know, people depending on you or kids, maybe quitting your job tomorrow because you're not happy isn't honest to them. So I, you know, how do you balance wanting to be who you really want to be every moment and honestly living up to your responsibilities? Yeah, that's a great question and thank you. Um, I think that's a hard thing. And I think when you come to a moment of realizing, ah, crap, this life I've built doesn't, you know, I'm a little off the track of, who I am and all the stuff I'm doing doesn't really match up. And there are people involved, there's relationships involved, there's jobs involved, and it's, it, I mean, it took me two years. When I said I quit my job, it's not like I just went boom and quit it that day. I, it took two years, because I wanted to take care of all the people that reported to me and make sure they had, it, it was a two year exercise. Um, so sometimes it's about, instead of the distance between what you want and what you're living, being filled with reasons why you're living that way. It's, it's making a plan, because they, they take time. Sometimes it's a plan, and then, um, I just had something brilliant I was gonna say to you and I forgot it. Uh, I think um, one, there's a little trick that I like to give people when it comes to when people, when I'm coaching people and they talk about, it, I do a bunch of this stuff that I don't really like all day long. And they'll, they'll you know, most of us have a list. Um, change your wording, and that sounds dumb, but it really works when we change our language. So for all the things that you would say, I have to do, I, I have to do this because uh, this person doesn't do it well. I have to do this because, whatever. Change that to I choose to. Because th that's the truth, is that even the stuff that we don't really want to do, but you get up and do it anyway, you're choosing to do it. Because there's very little that you have to do. I mean, you've got to breathe. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then you, like, people say pay taxes. No, you don't. Look at Willie Nelson. Um, you don't re there's not a lot you have to do. So we, we, we put this stuff on ourselves because, you know, we have responsibilities. You can look closer at that and, and you don't have to line things up by jumping over. You can take little steps and make little choices that get you a little closer to what you want without blowing the whole thing up like a dumpster fire behind you. So, and that's, and I did the same thing. It, it, like I said, it took me a while. Hey, hi, I'm right next door. Um, <laughs> I was inspired to come to your talk because um, I'm really interested in like people who are in the outdoor sports world and to draw the connection, <laughs> to draw the connection, um, I think that most of us don't live in a way that exposes us to death in, in any other um, manner other than like someone's passing, like like you said, we don't know. So they're either passing away, they have some illness or some surgery, or it's really unexpected, right? right? But there are people, to zoom out a little bit and to make the connection, there are people all over the world who are living in a much more, with a higher risk lifestyle. And some do it right. in the outdoor sports world and they inspire me because they're choosing to live a life that is 
dangerous, but so satisfying. And then there are also people, and this is my question for you, who aren't choosing to live in a way that is really dangerous and risky, and there's stuff happening all over the world right now, like refugee crisis yeah. situations. So my question for you is, like, what can we learn from them? Because I feel like, like you said, people respond to your profession or your, you know, you saying what you do with like, oh, that sounds really depressing. Well, there's other ways to look at it. And like, we can look at these refugees and the situations they're in and the fact that they're fighting for having a lifestyle or something to build consistency on so that they can follow their dreams and do the things they want to do before they die. And what can we learn from them? Because I feel like you would have a, something to say about maybe like what they could offer, like looking at those situations. That's, and, and now you've done the stump the speaker thing. Um, <laughs> Because that's something actually that I've, I've spent a lot of time thinking about. I've, uh, I call bullshit on the law of attraction in some ways. I mean, you know, sorry. Um, <laughs> some of the, sure, some of that absolutely works, but it's a real kind of privileged way to think about things. And I think about people who are living in circumstances that were absolutely unchosen. They were born into to something, and it's not like they can think thoughts and attract the, the life that they would rather have. Um, and, I, and I struggle with that because I think tragically and beautifully some of us can do some of that choosing and because we can we should. And I, the only thing I really know that I can take away from that is that because I have, and you're going to make me cry again, because I have some level of, of privilege, I better be aware of what it is, and I better use it to help people that don't have it. So, I, I don't, I, and I don't know if that's a thing I'm learning from, uh, from people in those situations or, I don't know what that is, but that's, anyway, that's the struggle I have with that. And at the end of it, I just feel like because I can have choices, one of them has to be to help out people who, who have less or who don't have them. Did that, is that an answer at all? Yeah. Okay. Just, a, just something to think about that I wanted to think about. Okay. I'm, he's new. I'm just going to let him have one because he's new. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, so Keith left, but he made an interesting comment about trying to be honest with, I think, a coworker or a family member. And it actually reminds me of something me and my wife have been talking about recently. And there were times I felt like, you know, I couldn't be honest with her because, you know, I tend to be the person who's, who's been called the nice asshole, if that makes sense. <laughs> So I've always it's called tended, a asshole. <laughs> um, sure. And I'm probably going to say something slightly controversial here, as in, you know, a lot of times I think people, the reason we can't be honest with other people is because other people get offended by whatever it is that person may have to say before thinking about what they said, they're already offended. So there are a lot of women in this room, and as a man who likes women, there are certain ways that you need to talk to women in order for them to go out with you and talk to you on a regular basis. There are some men who may not necessarily have those skills. That doesn't mean that they're not being honest, they just don't know a way to speak you know, in a particular way. So, you know, with me and my wife, there were situations where I felt like I couldn't be honest because I may offend her or she may feel a certain type of way. But just my perspective, I think that if we as individuals learn not to have those expectations or learn, you know, people express their ideas doesn't necessarily mean they're coming at me, doesn't necessarily they're offending me, and be more open and to those expectations or not having those expectations, I think that more of us could be honest and really say the things that we want to say without the world coming and trying to attack us or saying, oh, you're not being PC, because in reality being PC, you're closing off your mind to hearing what the person has to say and judging them before they can even express. Because what they have expressed may be true. It may be very true. It's just hard to understand or it hurts because we've already had that preconceived expectation of what it is. Does that make 
makes sense. It does make sense. Um, I, I, two, two things real quick to regard with what you said in the context of, of honesty. Um, one thing is, is that um, Don, uh, Don Miguel Ruiz, The Four Agreements, anybody read The Four Agreements? Okay, it's, read it if you haven't. Um, one of the agreements, and these are things that he says are, are basically you know, touchstones for getting through life. One of them is take nothing personally. So that's part of our responsibility in relationships and in being a person who's gonna hear from other people is take nothing personally because it's probably not about you. It's probably about the person who's saying it to you. And then the flip side of that is I think a lot of times people get defensive when they've shared something and someone gets offended because they say, well, that's not how it, that's not wasn't my intention. I didn't mean it that way. And what I want to encourage you to think about is that usually doesn't actually matter. What matters is how did it land? So even if it wasn't your intention, and you can explain that, but that becomes a defensive interaction then, the thing to do is go to that person instead of defending, I didn't, that's not what I meant, hang on a second, explore, tell me more about how that landed that way. It's another form of honesty that keeps us from, from making a big distance when we get defensive. So you may have intended it a certain way, but the way it landed with the person matters because it did land that way. So you can always move towards somebody by asking them about their reaction to something that you honestly shared and make sure that you're not doing that thing where you just kind of, you know, bam pow, this is how I feel and however you take it is your fault. So it's, it's both of, of those sides that we, we need to do in our personal relationships. Thank you.